Okay, JV, we are up and uh, welcome to Blab and welcome to the new timelines. A couple seconds of silence. Welcome to the new timelines, episode 119. Today we have JV Crumb III. JV Crumb III became a self made entrepreneur millionaire in his 20s. He's a best selling author, keynote speaker, certified business coach, licensed attorney, serial entrepreneur, and that goes on and on and on. I, JV, I know you're coming today from uh, Denver, Colorado. Is that right? That's correct. And you're on Blab. Congratulations. You are on Blab. This is only the second podcast I've actually done purely on Blab. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. So I guess I'm the new adventure for the new, uh, the new podcast, right? You'll be amazed at the quality of sound that, that we're going to get on this show. Um, it breaks. Blab is a fast moving technology. Um, it, it, I think just when you're done with the show, cause I, I sort of JV just signed up his account. This is brand new. I just emailed him last night. I was going to do this first on Skype and then just a couple minutes afterward, but we're going right on the blab. I'm, this is going to change podcasting. As you know, uh, the new timelines, basically I break it up into different categories. You're going to come underneath both being a podcaster, which you have an amazing show and have done 200 and what shooting on towards 300 yeah, shows. Yeah, we have, uh, we have two shows. Uh, in fact, uh, September 16th is our one year anniversary and we'll have uh, 1.9 million downloads. And then we're there in our eighth week of the uh, second show, which is conscious millionaire health reality podcast. So, uh, we're just in the ending our second month of that one. I, I love it. I mean, I've listened to one of your shows, and I, I, I yesterday, by the way, I listened to six or seven of your uh, shows from Conscious Millionaire, and oh, I was wow. I took the day off. I, I batched, like you say, I took the day off and batched the day off working around my house. Um, we live in Reno, Nevada, and I just worked around my house with my listen to podcasts all day till I was down to about three percent, and had a blast. Just not doing any work except you know working outside, having a good time, enjoying the beautiful weather here in Reno, Nevada. So, JV, the first thing I'm going to ask you, this is a little different. We sort of free flow this show, but I've got to ask you, how did you become a millionaire in your 20s? That's a hard thing to do unless you won the lottery because that's, that's just a tough thing to do. Um, well, actually, I decided at five I was going to grow up and be a millionaire. So I think that that uh, really made a, a big difference. I grew up out in the country. There were about two or 300 people in the little town we lived in, and everybody was financially challenged, let's say, you know, and by five, I had just gotten tired of going to the grocery store and knowing there was a grocery list and I couldn't ask for a candy bar. So one day I'm standing outside actually by the kumquat tree. And I said to myself, what's the solution to this? And I had a vision, actually. I looked out at the future. And I said, what is it I want out of my life? And it isn't this. And I went, oh. I know I'll become a millionaire. Now, you know, lots of little kids say things like that. But for me, it was a transformational moment because at that moment in time, I believed it so strongly that what was interesting is that very quickly within a few years, I kept wondering why we weren't wealthy because I was supposed to be living in a millionaire's uh, family. But I ran in, I told my mom and dad, like I had discovered water, right? And I said, when I grew up, I'm going to be a millionaire. Now, I'm sure lots of parents have had this experience with their kids. And so they just go, isn't that cute, right? My mom actually shook her fingers at me and said, don't tell anybody, which I had to figure out when I wrote my book, Conscious Millionaire. And I realized it's because we lived across the church. And in their mind, anybody who had that much money must have done something wrong because good people were basically kind of poor and middle class. And I mentioned that because you're listening to this and that kind of belief system may be running around in your mind and it may be holding you back from achieving what you could be achieving. So at any rate, I was determined I was going to become a millionaire. And what, you know, as life unfolds, there's always these synchronous moments. Now I was finishing up a master's in clinical and testing psych and I came home and I was working on my thesis. So I was in California, came back to Florida. And my dad was really a good entrepreneur in the sense that he could figure out where the money was, but it was a really horrible business guy and that he didn't really run a business very well. And he was like frequently lost money. And so he was basically on the verge of bankruptcy and had these trucking lines that were just bleeding money. And he goes, will you come back and go into business and work with me? And I said, well, this has absolutely nothing. At that point, I had gotten accepted into a PhD program in psychology and had decided since I did some research that that was definitely not the route to become a millionaire. And I had gone to college to be a doctor, but I decided I didn't want to be a doctor. I decided the conclusion was to go be a, a lawyer. 
it seemed to me that lawyers did well and I, I, I did well in logic and that type of thing. So I was planning to go to law school at this point. So uh, being involved with the trucking line had nothing to do with my path, but it was really one of those family things where I loved my dad and I could see that he was depressed. And, and I said, well, I said, I'll come back and I'll work with you for six months. Now, here's the interesting thing, because I grew up in a family that really had a lot of financial challenges and my dad was a, a business guy. I had it encoded, and I'm mentioning this because if you're listening, you might have encoded something like this along the way, that the way you go broke and don't have any money is to own a business. So the last thing you want to do is own a business. So here I was going, well, you know, I'll help you for six months, but this seems like a really bad idea. After all, it's a business and we never made any money. However, I was kind of like a duck to water. And in six months time, I had really turned the entire company around, installed what I now know were systems, because that's how I thought, uh, had started a second company to do all of our maintenance, because I realized the suppliers were you know, taking advantage of us. And by the end of the third year, we were making as much as six-figure profits in a year. I bought my dream four-story luxury townhouse, the Mercedes, and all of this by the time I was 25. And basically, I had the... You could look back and go, well, it wasn't the opportunity I was looking for, but I was looking constantly for how am I going to become a millionaire? It isn't why I helped my dad, but very quickly I figured out, oh, I think this is the route. So why don't we build this, even though it's not what I want to do? What's interesting about the story is that within three months of getting this you know, beautiful dream house and all of this, I'm on the water and I looked out one day about three months in and I said, you know, I'm really not happy. I'm not fulfilled. I don't even like myself. I don't know how to have any kind of good relationships. All I've done is I accomplished the dream of having the million dollars, which in, especially in the United States, I think that's kind of the dream that people think if I get the money, everything else is going to be right. Because as a little kid, that's what I thought. I didn't dissect it as a little kid and go, oh, I'll have perfect relationships and I'll be fulfilled and all of that. Because at five, you're not really thinking about that. At five, I was thinking about how do I get the candy bar? And in many ways, maybe not having the candy bar gave me the motive to become a millionaire. But once I got there, I realized that I had something was missing. And I spent the next 15 years going to sweat lodges and spiritual retreats and Tony Robbins and reading every personal growth book that I could find, listening to all the audio programs to find out what is missing that I could have the money that you and the Mercedes and all this, and you would think that that was going to make me happy, but I really wasn't very happy. And what I realized was that I was missing doing anything that was meaningful or had purpose, that I wasn't helping people in a way that I want to be helping them, which if you go back to psychology, was all about personal development, helping people transform, helping people get ahead, which in many ways is what I do at Conscious Millionaire. I help entrepreneurs double, triple their businesses, grow from six to seven figures, double a seven figure. I can do, you know, work with any of those kind of clients, but the transformation they get as human beings is really the magic. Okay. And so that always kind of stayed in there. So I sold the companies and went off to, to find out what was I supposed to be doing with my life. So when you went to work for your dad, I think one thing that you had going for you is even though you said that, you know, your dad was struggling with a business, you grew up in an entrepreneurial household. Your, your dad was self-employed, had his own business. And, but it was tough though, right? Yeah, but it was tough because he, it, I actually didn't hang out with him for the business part because I just always saw that it was a failure. But what was interesting is that I was always doing little businesses. At four, I got a pup tent for, for my uh, birthday and we had a tangerine tree. So that was really technically my first little business. And instead of the lemonade stand, I set up the pup tent where the high school students got off the bus because I figured they had some money and I actually sold them and we didn't have any containers. So my grandmother lived with us and we, we saved egg cartons. So I would take and squeeze, as you imagine, into 12 little compartments, tangerine juice. That's what I'd spend my day doing. And then when the kids got off the uh, bus, I'd sell it to them for a dime, which I'm quite certain they threw it away. But, um, you know, that was my first encounter. And then dad farmed. And when I was seven, we had um, peanuts. He farmed peanuts. Now, this is the South. I was going to say, what part of the country are you in? It's got to be the yeah, South. Well, so you're in Florida. And so this, this may not be something that's characteristic of all of the country. But in, in the South, boiled peanuts mm -hmm. is a really big deal. We're, we're in the South. Well, yeah, you boil peanuts, you put salt in them. 
And so dad helped me. We cleaned the peanuts, we'd boil them. And I went around and sold my boiled peanuts all over the little town. And, and in fact, I learned how to double my business in the scene. My dad knew where the money was. He goes, well, son, you ought to go in the morning and then go back in the afternoon and sell the same people some more boiled peanuts. And that's yeah, what that's I did. Good, good business. So, yeah. People bought it 10 o'clock in the morning and they bought about three or four in the afternoon and they had boiled peanuts all, all day long. So it must've been a little town somewhere in the Northern Florida. I'm guessing. No, actually, it's in the central part of oh, Central. Where, where in the central? Uh, well, do you know where Ocala is? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was a pilot out of Fort Rucker, so I know every via, via every nav aid in the south. Uh, okay. Well, it was a little town called Oklawaha, uh -huh. and it was uh, about 18 miles outside of Ocala. Yep. Had my first boiled peanuts at Fort Rucker, Alabama. Uh, Jimmy yep. Carter's home is so, not far away. Well, then they probably were done right, I guess. Yeah, you know, I got used to him. It's a acquired I, I, He didn't talk much about it as, as president, but I suppose he knew how to boil, boil some peanuts. Yep, yep. I mean, uh, it's acquired taste, and it, it's definitely all over the South, Enterprise, Ozark. Uh, yeah, it needs stuff. So Florida to Denver, um, interesting transition. I know you did a lot of work down in Denver. You know, I think what you have is you have that entrepreneur spirit and background that your family brought you up. Farmers are all entrepreneurs for the most part, unless, you know, they're, they're industrial farmers working for somebody. But. Right. Yeah. Well, no, my dad was very entrepreneurial. Uh -huh. that, that's what I said. That, and, and, and he knew where the money was, but he didn't organize. What was missing was that he didn't organize in systems. I was going to say, your last shows, every time you have a show, you talk about systems. Right. And that's why I focus on steps and sequences and systems. And that's what I help people with, because uh, when an entrepreneur all of a sudden starts starts looking at their business from that perspective, that's when you can double and triple it in a very short period of time because you're getting the company running correctly and it's focused. You know where you're headed. Yep, that's right. Systems, processes. And you got to, you know, part of your system is watching your money and your cash flow. Well, it is. And the other big piece is having a big vision that really not, not, I look at it as it pulls you, it pulls you forward. So the big, the big um, why, the big, what I call your true north, the, it's that difference that you want to make that you're passionate about. And for me, it's like, I want to wake people up to who they really are and what their real potential is and what's possible for us as human beings, not just individually, but as a society. And how does our business contribute to other people and make a better world for all of us? I call it the triple win. How do you, others, and society all win together? And that comes by the kind of products and services you provide. And those come out of your heart when they're the best. And then they go out in the marketplace and find out who really wants that. And then you hone it down the way they want it. Okay, very good. Well, since you're on the new timeline, we're going to change the format just a little bit. And we're going to go, okay. we're going to go into your success and life principles. You have eight of them. You've written a book. Right. It's in the book. What's the name of the book again? It's success. It's Conscious Millionaire, Grow Your Business by Making a Difference. Right. Conscious Millionaire, Grow Your Business by Making a Difference. They're going to open up the very end of this podcast to a couple questions on Blab, and we'll let a couple of people come in and ask you some questions. Again, this is all new. I'm having a blast on Blab, hooking it in with podcasting. I think it's a new area, and it's a powerful area. So without further ado, JV, tell us your eight success principles. Just list them off, and we'll go over and, and talk about uh, sure. them. Sure. Uh, absolutely. Well, you know, the first one is that you've got to make conscious decisions. So those are decisions where you're making them from awareness and you've considered the different possibilities. So you're making decisions consciously as opposed to reactively. Then next, you've got to develop laser focus. And that laser focus, I really like people to focus on no more than three things at any time, <clears throat> three priorities, three goals, but that there's one that's number one for you. And that no matter what happens, you're absolutely certain at the end of the week, you're going to have accomplished this one. And now once you've made your conscious decisions and you're laser focused, you need to take fast action because the universe rewards speed. Who gets there first really does matter. And finishing on Thursday, what could have been done in Friday leaves you another day to work on something else. Now, here's really a key one. And it, it's quintessential conscious millionaire. And that is do what's right. When you approach your business and you approach your life, not just from a rule based, oh, well, these are our policies. Look, if somebody's, it's, you, you have a policy of a 30 day money back guarantee, but it's 60 days, it's 90 days. And you really have somebody who's using the product. They don't like it. They're not happy. They don't want it. Give them the money back. 
you know, if you just approach your business in your life, always asking, well, what's the right thing to do here? And then listening and kind of balancing the options. I think that that is, it, there's a very important principle to live by. Now, next, you have to leverage yourself daily. You can leverage yourself through technology. You can leverage yourself through the people that you know. Doing this podcast is a leverage because there are going to be thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people exposed to this specific podcast episode. That's a leverage for me. It's a leverage for Bill. And then if you put it out on your uh, social media, you're actually leveraging content as well. And you're getting the notoriety of saying, oh, I had these experts and I'm, I'm going to leverage this as a connection. All right. Six, seek opportunities. Every day, Open your mind, your awareness, your consciousness to what is it that you want, and then constantly seek opportunities and become aware of the opportunities around you. Seventh, learn and grow. You must devote a certain percentage of the money that you have coming in to go back out to educate yourself, books, audio programs, training. This is the only way to get ahead is that you are living every day as a learning, growing human being. So learning is that you're bringing new information in, but you're also noticing what works and doesn't work that you did. So you're looking at the feedback you get and every day you wake up to grow as a person. And then eighth, this is actually my personal motto, trust, perfect timing. And by that, I mean something very specific. When you're present, when you're open, when you're authentic, you will go through a vortex in which you get into a flow of life. And what you notice is that there's already perfect timing around you. And yet you're also participating in the creation of that perfect timing. What I've noticed is that perfect timing occurs when you're open, when you're present, and when you're being real and authentic with yourself. So I live by that every day. And when things don't go the way that I had expected, I step back, I take a breath and I go, okay, maybe this isn't the right moment for this. Maybe this is going to occur later at a bigger way or a different way, or something else is going to come into this time space that's actually going to be better for me, for my business, for the people that I'm serving. So I take that as a way to live my entire life, to trust the perfect timing that's occurring around me because everything's connected in a, in a complete mosaic of life. Well, that's, that's a heck of an eight, and that's all out of your book, too. You know, that's what a great way to develop a book off of eight principles of that nature. And it's taken you a lifetime, I take it, to come up with these concepts and ideas. Well, it's really from how everything that's in my book is, uh, is really comes out of my life experiences and what I've noticed works. So, number one, make conscious decisions. Make, make conscious decisions. Go a little more detail on that. What, first of all, what, the word conscious, what does that mean to you? You ask everyone well, else that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really good question. And in fact, I go into quite detail in the book about this is that when I was writing the book and I wrote it over seven years and I wrote it seven times. So at some point I noticed that I was using conscious to mean more than one thing and I had to kind of dissect it apart. I realized that I was actually using it three different ways. One is to mean awareness. Now, awareness can mean aware of who you are aware of what's going on in the environment, aware of business principles and how you make money, aware of trends in the environment around you. Awareness can also mean an, an awakening that has spiritual qualities to it. It's becoming more alive, more awake as a human being as to who you are in a, in a, in a bigger sense. And that leads to the second way that conscious can be used, and that's visionary. So you talk about visionary consciousness. So you talk about uh, Steve Jobs and the iPhone, Beethoven and a symphony, an artist, anybody who has Gandhi has has great vision for what can happen in the future, something that can change, something that can uh, be brought into the reality we're living in that isn't here yet. And that's when you open your literally your mind and your consciousness and you let this expand. And there is a bigger consciousness in the world that's all around us. And we connect with that. And that's where we get our great visions of what's possible for society, for our lives, for products, for our clients. So that's visionary consciousness. And the third type is really critical in the 21st century. And that's more about the uh, being socially conscious. Now, socially conscious can mean uh, everybody having the same rights, but socially conscious can mean doing green products and uh, being sustainable and making sure that we're not damaging the environment so that 20, 30 years from now, we can have water. 
So all of that comes under social consciousness. Conscious can mean all three. And what's, what's really interesting to me is that different people are attracted to conscious millionaires, sometimes by primarily one of those. And then they might learn about, oh, there's other ways that I can be conscious as well. So everybody comes in the door that's right for them. There's some people building conscious businesses that are all green. There are people who are building conscious businesses that aren't green at all, but it's really about their calling and what they're here to do and the difference they can make and how they can help uh, uplift and transform other people. Those are the core characteristics of what's going on in a conscious millionaire business. That's a, that's a, that's good. I'm really happy you answered that question because you always ask your inter the people you interview, uh, what does conscious mean to you or what? I think that's one of your questions. How does yeah, that know? I call it my rabbit hole question. What's your favorite answer of all this? Can uh, you remember uh, anyone specific? There's no favorite answer because I always love the fact that someone's expressing who they are. I have thought that I might put together a recording because mm -hmm. we're now uh, almost at show number 300 and put together a recording that would just have different people's answers and we just cut and, and put those in a recording because, or put a hundred of them because it's very interesting to get the answers. And it tells me a lot about the person and where they are and what's important to them and what their priorities are and what their personal journey is about. Because how you answer that question and the next one that I always ask, what's the legacy you want to leave, uh, really is the personal meaning questions that I ask. Okay. Let's go down through them. We're going to run out of time. I'm going to ask you a little bit about your podcast equipment systems, and then we're going to open up for uh, the audience for a few seconds. Sure. And finally, uh, how we can contact you. I'm having a lot of fun on this new platform. So um, laser focus, that's pretty straightforward. Yes. Well, and it means that you've got to be, to be laser focused. Uh, the really important part about being laser focused is you've got to be clear about that specific result that you want to achieve. And then you laser focus on it. And that determines which fast actions you take. But until you're conscious of the result, get laser focused on it. You don't even know which actions to take. And one of the biggest challenges and mistakes a lot of entrepreneurs make, and it wastes a lot of time, money, and energy, is they jump right in. They want to take all these actions and they want to go after what we call these days shiny objects. They want to go after all kinds of tactics, but they don't know <laughs> why and they don't know where they're headed and they don't know how long it, they want it to take for them to get and they get there and they don't know where they're going to be in 30, 60, or 90 days because they haven't mapped it out. All of that's in the conscious stage, which is really the most important part. And when you take conscious focused action together, that also is my formula for creating wealth that I uh, talk about in the book. So I bring That's called serendipitous. And a lot of entrepreneurs have that brain that is serendipitous. They're always asking, looking, experimenting. Right. Well, it's great to be experimenting, but you need to know where you're headed. Right, right. So uh, take fast action. Boy, right. I yeah. So you, you really, once you, once you know what the result is, you know the path, then you want to take your actions quickly and start moving forward and get momentum going. You know, these sound like some of the principles of war. I, I'm a West Point grad. Oh, okay. <laughs> Or we That's, can think of them as the principles of collaboration and conscience. collaboration. Yeah. I'm just saying some of the actions when you're, um, when you're fighting a war or what, take action, move, I mean, everything you're saying, I think everything, these principles apply to a lot of elements of life. Yeah, abso so, absolutely. Absolutely. Make sure of number four, do, do what is right. Yeah. I think this is the one that really taps into the deeper levels of consciousness that why are we here on earth? I think we're here on earth to be of service to one another, to live our lives at our fullest, to live our lives full of joy and happiness. And I think all that comes and build great families and relationships. It all comes at the core from doing what's right. Yeah, right. And leveraging yourself. Number six, yeah. five. Well, you've constantly got to be leveraging yourself. I mean, one of my specific outcomes that I want, one of the measuring points for my life is that I want to positively impact a billion people. And the only way that can occur, and it can occur. I mean, if you, I encourage you today to create what I would call a lofty goal for yourself, one that really excites you because then I created that goal and I started going, yes, absolutely. And how is it gonna happen? Through leverage, 100%. There's one of me, there's a billion people I wanna impact. How do I get through them? Through leverage. I'm going to sidetrack a little bit on your list here. I didn't see anything about goals, but there's a fundamental um, element of gold and plant goals and plannings and yeah, systems. That's all part of being conscious because when you're conscious, you choose your result. That's what you laser focus on. And then you take the actions to get there. What do you think of uh, smart goals? They're just thought. Yeah. I mean, it's basic NLP. 
I've got nine years of NLP training. So smart goals, you want them measurable, you want them specific, you want them time sensitive. You know, that's how I create, you know, all the goals that I work with. They have to be that way. And and the first goal you need to know is where's it you want to be at the end of this week so that every day you can focus your priorities on getting there. Quick question. You said NLV. Explain that to the listeners. NLP, listener. neurolinguistic programming. NLP. Okay. Yep. 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 Got it. That's I misunderstood. I've that's okay. Everyone's heard. Yeah, I think most people have heard of NLP. Uh, Bandler and Grinder, uh, you know, created it. I studied with uh, most in the 80s and 90s. I studied with most of the people who were the the first generation. Uh, Tad James, White Woodsma, uh, the Reeses, uh, Connie Ray, Andreas. Uh, all of these people created uh, the core pieces of NLP. Very good. You know, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I since I'm interviewing people, I, I try to always listen to their podcasts before I go ahead and interview them. But some I'll listen to more than others. Your interviews have been packed with information. Oh, and I understand now from interviewing you why there's so much good information. I think before you actually take someone's advice, you have to find out about that. Person. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure it's good advice. We're talking about goals just before we slip real fast. Just um, smart goals are specific, measurable, uh, attainable, relevant, time bound. And um, they're specific, I think. Did I say that? Right. Specific. Specific. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I think of those as more like an operations order of taskers as opposed to a goal being lofty. And you mentioned that earlier, have a lofty. Well, I think that's where that's really where vision comes in. And at the core of conscious mode in our business is that true north. It's your, the, the, the difference that you want to make that you're passionate about and that you also have strengths so that you can accomplish it. And that needs to be a big vision. And when it's a big, compelling, emotionally charged vision of, of some major difference you want to make out there in the world, you're also going to attract people to work with you. And you're going to attract clients in a community of people who are really em empowered by even hearing about that vision. You know, I, when I think of entrepreneurs having those visions, I think also politicians and some of our great, better leaders had those visions, whether it's going to the moon in 10, year, 10 years. Right. Well, well absolutely. I mean, we go back and that's John F. Kennedy. You know, mm -hmm. I think that we had uh, and in the past, particularly, we've had people who had great visions. At different times different in history times of in the history. United States. Right. I mean, you go back to Gandhi. I mean, look at look at his vision. It was a huge vision. And, but it was the vision that compelled him. It was the vision that brought everybody together. Believing in this vision was what made it work. Yeah. Martin Luther King is with a dream. I have a dream. Right. And, and that was a big vision. So seek opportunity. Six. Yeah. Opportunities are really all around you. The difference between you, you seeing them and not seeing them is having your mind focused on them. And that goes back to laser focus. If you know the result you want, let me give you an example. I go to conferences, I go to networking events, and I've noticed there's a huge difference between my outcomes and a lot of other people. And in fact, I've trained people on this. I typically go with one, two, or three, because I work in groups of three, uh, priorities. And then I have measurable outcomes that I want by the time I'm through with that conference. And then I do a follow-up within 24 hours of everybody I've met and uh, send them an email so that they've heard from me. So I leave the day after a conference open so I can do all my follow-up because people are going to forget you. You had a three or four minute conversation and it was great, but they aren't going to remember who you are if you don't follow up with them. But because I get there with a specific outcome, I very quickly can know if somebody I'm talking to is somebody that I need to continue a conversation with, or I need to politely say, hey, I hope you have a really great conference, which I do. And then I go on to the next person because I'm looking for specific outcomes. And that's how I go to the conference. That's how you have to go through your day, that, that you're really clear about what it is you want to accomplish with your business uh, a year from now, nine 90 days from now, 60, 30, you know what the top priorities are. You know what your business is about and you know who you're looking for, for clients, for strategic partners, for the kinds of opportunities that are going to fit because you're going to get all kinds of opportunities, but you've got to discard a majority of them because they don't really fit for your plan. They're actually going to take you off track. But if you're constantly focused on this, then when you are in line to get coffee and you hear something, you go, ah, oh, that's maybe something I should you know, I should investigate, or you turn to the person who said it and you start a conversation with them. 
but you do it and it's very strategic. This is really going through life from a very strategic, focused, specific way that you are looking for the outcomes that you want. You know the vision, you know the difference you want to make, and you're looking for what might help me get there. That's an opportunity for you. A lot of people just pick up opportunities that are not right for them. It takes them off track, costs them a lot of time, money, energy. And, and instead of their business growing, they're just going off in three or four directions that, that have absolutely nothing to do with their goals. Especially now with the uh, evolution of the new digital age and right. things changing and moving so fast. Learn and grow. Learn and grow to me is the core of life. I mean, I wake up every morning. I've, I've often said this and I've, I've thought through it, that if I were told, you know, you could live in this great mansion, you could have all these amazing things, but you couldn't grow anymore. I'd say it's time to leave. I, I wouldn't even want to be here another day. I would be bored completely. I get up in the morning to grow, to learn, to change, to what, one of my favorite words is to iterate. And another one is to journey. Life is a journey. It's a journey of iterating. It's a journey of constant change and getting those inputs and having those thoughts and allowing time for you, you to, to have the inputs that will allow you to grow as a person, to read books, audios, podcasts. So you're taking in this information, but then you're utilizing it in some way. And that's where the growth comes from. Trust perfect timing. That's how I live. Uh, there's perfect timing all around us. We connect with perfect timing. I think we also co-create it, but only in that one state where you are really present and you're open to possibilities and you're living with authenticity. What I've discovered, that's when you connect with the perfect timing. And it's a mosaic that there's a perfect timing of how things are unfolding. And it may not have anything to do with the logical timing that you've created, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have logical timing. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have plans. It means that once you've made your plans, be open that there might be a perfect timing way to accomplish them a hundred times faster, or that there are other players that need to be in your life than the ones you've identified. How does luck hook in with perfect timing? Yeah. To me, luck is really just another word for someone connecting into perfect timing. Uh, that's the way I use luck. When I was young, I was a city councilman and I had a private dinner with Ernest Gallo, my wife and I, and I asked him a quick question. I said, uh, Mr. Gallo, how did you take a 40 acre ranch and turn it into a $2 billion wine industry? And he looked at me and said, I got lucky luck. Yeah. But he was there at the right time. That's what. Yeah. Right after prohibition, yeah. right after prohibition, he started his business. Right. And he worked hard too. He was a hard worker. And his dad um, was a grape grower, but did not share the recipe to making wine They with him. He had to go figure it out himself. Oh, really? Interesting. And a, a little library book in Modesto. Well, uh, JV, this, this, is a, this is really, really good interview. And I thank you for being a good sport. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up to the audience and I want to talk a little bit about how you podcast your tools and we'll connect and see how to get with you. I know you've got another interview coming up in a few minutes. Yeah, so. I do. I'm just opening this up so people can come in. We've had uh, 12 people come in and out, and this is new. Uh, we have somebody watching right now. It's welcome to come on and ask you a question. Love to have that happen on the show so we can show. I'm sure that's going to start happening as you start watching. I'm sure you're going to hook in and watch uh, blab.im on your spare time, which you probably don't have a lot. So tell us, just in closing, about your podcast. You learn to podcast yourself, and that's a tough thing to do. I'll, I'll tell you, there's a lot of elements in podcasting. There's a lot of ways you can podcast. As you can see today, we're podcasting a little differently. Right. What what um, what tool? What do thing? What the, what do you like best about podcasting? And what oh, type of what I like best about it is connecting with all the guests, and then um, going someplace and hearing from people who are listeners about the value that it's bringing to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the most fun part is that I. This week and next week between I'm on 17 shows as a guest and I do 26 wow. podcast interviews for my own two podcasts. So that's 42 times I get to connect with amazing people and have great conversations. And I'm going, wow, this is this is a lot of fun. I know. I know you must delegate out a lot of different things. I know you had Infusionsoft. I think you've changed off of Infusionsoft, haven't you? Yeah, I use Entreport. Entreport. When did you make that change? Just recently? No, I made it about a year and a half, uh, two years ago. Okay. Okay. I thought I saw it in Fusionsoft. 
Um, Entreport, now you've, have you contracted out or you, you must be delegating out to do as much as you're doing? Cause I know how much work is behind the scenes. Yeah. I have a couple of people who help me and I have uh, Tiffany who does all of my podcasts producing. She does all the editing, the tweets, uh, the marketing pieces. We had a meeting before this um, and we meet every day and then we have, you know, the approaches and we constantly are shifting those. And, but I, then I make all the high level decisions. No, I think if you're going to be serious about creating this new network podcast, whatever it might be, I think podcast is a limiting word. It's more in podcasting. Like right now we're live, you know, on this other elements, we're going to be a lot of different places in this podcast. We're going to be on YouTube. We're going to be on blab. We're going to be, you know, in different areas that the RSS feed goes up. But I think what you're doing is what I'm not doing is you're actually delegating out elements. Um, I've done it sort of as a, I don't know, as a learning experience in life, learning how to podcast and connect and do different things. Um, and to tell the truth is podcasting, building, building a website to me is tougher than building a set of custom home plans. No, oh, I don't, I don't build the website. I have a web guy. Uh, I come up with the ideas and I have a copywriter and a marketer that yeah. are also working with me. I'd say, you know, I, I, I'm not taking my own advice, but what you putting out, how you're doing your podcasting is the way to do, if you're serious and you want to make it into a business, you've got to do it like you're doing it. And just think of all the people that you're, you're interviewing and touching, just oh, keeping on doing that over a period of time. You're going amazing. to, and you know, some of them are super famous and some of them you've never heard of before. What's, what's great to me is that they all have a great story to tell and they all have great knowledge and expertise to share. And it's just fun connecting. Right. Right. Now in the whole big realm of things, how important is marketing? Marketing's marketing's 80% of your business. Marketing and selling is 80% of your business. Now, the the thing that I need to quickly add, that other 20% is a lot of time and energy as well. Yeah. But without the marketing and selling, you don't have a business. All you well, you're is, really leveraging yourself too by right. hiring the right people and creating the team. And you can do more virtual teams too. Well, where do you see yourself? This is the last question. Where do you see yourself in a few years from now with the podcast and with your life? Yeah. Uh, three years from now, I I have certain products that we're creating. We're creating a business academy. So I see us as a very strong seven-figure business uh, with all the systems in place, uh, really hammering down. Probably I'm adding a third podcast that I'm doing in January. Then beyond that, I'm considering bringing on other hosts and making and extending the family beyond three podcasts. So that's an option that I have open. And then three to five years from now, I I plan to begin living at least half time and I may become a full expatriate and live in Asia. And I plan to take conscious wow. millionaire to Asia. And, but I plan to be spending at least half of my time in Asia three to five years from now. So that's my strategic goal for how I'm building the business and then how I plan to leverage it in a big way. I can't leave you without asking where in Asia and what makes you want to go to Asia? Well, I've, uh, I lived at a Buddhist monastery for a while to learn to meditate okay. Uh, my ideal diet is really Asian. Uh, philosophically, I fit in there. I've been to seven Asian countries. I love the Asian people. I love the territory. It's beautiful. I mean, Asia is just absolutely stunning. Probably uh, maybe explore living in Bangkok for a while. I've been to Bangkok. I've been to Chiang Mai. It has a lot of entrepreneurs. So I like Thailand. I mean, it's a really beautiful country. I love the food from Thailand. Uh, so, you know, that might be kind of a starting jumping off place. That takes a lot. I mean, that's a, that's a big change and it's only half time. That's kind of neat going well, overseas. Well, well, you know, you got to try it out next year. I'm going to try out living in multiple places in the United States. So I'm probably going to spend mm -hmm. two months in San Diego and try that out. I yep. have a sister city, uh, the home of podcasting. Yeah. It doesn't really matter because my whole team's virtual anyway. And, right. uh, New York city is on my list. Uh, Santa Barbara's on my list of places. And what I've done, I've done this before is you just go and you rent a furnished place it's a furnished rental and you stay there. Yep. I've stayed as long as three and four months in places. Uh, San Francisco, I did that. I did it in Pebble Beach. And it gives you, you know, and now the way that I've organized the business entirely. In virtual. Reno, you've been in Reno. I have been in Reno, right? Absolutely. Click that one off. Yep, we <laughs> click that one off. It's, so it's, uh, it, it, it's actually in Reno that Conscious Millionaire came to me uh, by going over to uh, San Francisco. But, you know, basically... I wanted to have a mobile and really adventuresome lifestyle. And uh, so that's what I'm creating while building the, the, the business. That's really the one I want to be building. Well, JV, I'm kind of disappointed. We didn't get someone queuing in, but we did have 12 people stop by and we still nice. have someone on and that's uh, Kimron 
Kimron, I said, I think I said that right, Kimron, you're out there. If you want to come on up and ask a quick question so we can uh, show folks what this is all about. I'm sure in the future, and we're going to do another one of these in the afternoon. I have another interview this afternoon and we'll, it'll be grow because people will see this and they'll come back onto it and uh, love to have someone ask a question, tune in. And that's the future of this new Blab system. It's a feature for me in podcasting and you just heard it for the first time. It's really, really new. So I think you'll know it after this. But uh, JV, this was a really, really, really good uh, interview, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure uh, some days our paths will cross. I like to meet people face to face and see them face to face, which is a nice thing. I'm sure we will. So when you come to Reno again, let's go down to the Stone House. I don't know if you remember different places to eat around here. No, I actually was cooking cooking myself most of the time. It's in the Northeast. I live up um, McCarran Ranch, up oh, okay. towards the mountains. Yep. I love where I live. I'm only I can walk 45 minutes to downtown, and my daughter goes to re my daughter's. When Reno High School, which is a very good high school, I can't really do what you're doing though, and tell her out of high school and tell her so. Yeah, that kind of that can sometimes make a difference. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. How do we get a hold of you? What's yeah, the easiest way? Just go to consciousmillionaire.com. You can find my two podcasts. Clicking on the podcast. If you own a six-figure business and you'd really like to transform it into a seven-figure, you're ready to double the business. Just go to the coaching tab. There's an application to have a complimentary call with me. Be glad to do that. And uh, also on the homepage. There's the, the First Millionaire Manifesto. It's right at the top. Just click on that and uh, you can sign up and download it. It's 35 page document of the seven steps, really the seven qualities that you need to develop to create a seven figure life. Well, very good, JV. I appreciate that. And we'll have all the links in a couple different places on Podcasters Home. You can get to the sites or on Timelines of Success. And again, you can Google the new timeline show and you'll find it, or you can go up on uh, iTunes. A rating is always appreciated and uh, make sure you tune in to the conscious millionaire. That's a, that's a great podcast. Uh, I six much. or seven of them yesterday. I definitely zoned in. What's <laughs> bad about that though? You know, you get so many different names and people, you get them all mixed up. I understand. Do Thanks, interviews in two weeks. <laughs> Stay on for a second. Well, that's the end of the show. Okay. Um, I'm still on the backside. I was hoping someone would come up on the open seat. I've got I to go that, because I was supposed to be on another interview. I, I apologize on that one, but I do appreciate very, very much and great, great interview Thank and you. really enjoy your show. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having Thanks. Me. Bye -bye. Take care. I forgot to tweet out. <laughs> if you hit that little tweet button. Well, folks, uh, thank you for tuning in to the, uh, interview with timelines. Uh, this is a, a whole new uh, environment wor working these podcasts on Blab. I don't think many people are doing it yet. I only really know of a couple. So we'll have to see how it goes. I'm going to cut this, of course, edit it. Um, Blab will get an MP3. Anybody out there want to come back on and uh, say hi? Um, it, we had 12 viewers, which is really interesting. This is a, a really good uh, podcast. It's going to be downloaded you know, hundreds of times. I wish it was thousands. But hundreds of times it'll be downloaded. Be listened to on MP3s, on smartphones, different places that. It'll also be up in Blab. It'll be up on um, a YouTube uh, today as a preview. And I'm doing another one tonight for those out there uh, who, who happen to listen to this at uh, 6 p.m. And today is September 8th, 2015. Without further ado, I'm going to.